The developers of Blasphemous created one of the strangest, most surreal, most horrific, and most opaque villains I have ever seen anywhere. Even by calling the Miracle a villain, I feel like I'm doing the writing a disservice. Because the Miracle is so much more than just a simple antagonist. As horrific and hideous as its manifestations are, the way it has transformed this world into a nightmare, a place of hideous punishment and suffering, the Miracle is also oddly sympathetic at times. The Miracle is this alien force, this being of incomprehensible power and indiscernible motivation, which doesn't only punish but also sometimes blesses. Sometimes it soothes the very pain it creates, it forges esoteric and arduous paths to redemption. But the Miracle is also a deception. The wounds of Eventide DLC reveal that the Miracle is actually all a big lie. The Miracle is a creation of the High Wills, a selfish triple god which, on the backs of incredible human suffering, is building a glorious world apart. A dream world. A heavenly place. But it is not building that other world as a paradise for its worshippers. It is building that paradise as a monument to its own power. Let's start this video with a brief history of the land of Sistodia, the setting of Blasphemous. Once upon a time, Sistodia was a world much like our own. It was a world of basically ordinary people living basically ordinary lives in a medieval setting that would have felt very familiar to us. It was not a world of magic or monsters, but a world of plows and townships. There was religion here, and even back then it was obsessed with sin and guilt, with punishment and penance, though perhaps not quite as fanatical as it became later on, after the first miracle manifested. The people worshipped something they called the High Wills, an abstract and distant god whose power was not yet felt in the world. Whether or not it is truly a god is hard to say, but it certainly wields godlike power. There's a fan theory that I really like, which says that the High Wills were born as a reflection of the people of Sistodia themselves. Somehow, their collective psyche birthed this being in a dream world. And because they are obsessed with sin and guilt, so is the god they birthed. Because the people were selfish and violent, cared more about religious splendor and grandiosity than they cared about compassion, so too did their new god. The High Wills claim that they spoke themselves into existence. That once there was nothing and then there was a voice. Perhaps the voice of the people of Sistodia, prayers and lamentations and sacred texts. In this voice weaved the High Wills from nothing and the High Wills looked and behaved as Sistodia believed a god should. The High Wills are a god who listens, who answers prayers, but never quite in the way you expect. There's a monkey's paw quality to its power. The blessings of the High Wills always feel like a curse. The first manifestation of its power in the world was an event known as the First Miracle. One day, a boy overcome by his sense of guilt begged the High Wills for punishment, and the High Wills graciously accommodated him in a grotesque manner. He held a wooden log in his lap, and as he prayed, pleaded for punishment, his body began to miraculously twist around the log, and he and the log both grew into the twisted and tortured shape of a tree, a living tree that dripped golden sap. This act, the first miracle, transformed the world of Sistodia. It didn't immediately become the land of nightmares and monsters that we see in the present, but it did become a kingdom gripped by intense religious fervor and fanaticism. The boy who had transformed into the twisted tree became a religious icon, a symbol of worship, a symbol of the blessing of God, whose form you can find all across Sistodia. I think it was only after the first miracle, proof of the High Will's existence and power, that the religion of the High High Wills really grew in numbers and strength, became so powerful and so widespread that its bishops and inquisitors could dominate all aspects of life in Sistodia. The location of the first miracle became the center of a massive cathedral complex, bigger and more imposing than any castle from which His Holiness, the papal figure of this organized religion, would rule over his theocracy with an iron fist. Hundreds of other cathedrals were built in the surrounding country, each an exhibition of the people's new fanatic religious faith. Sistodia became a land of bloody inquisitions, in which the inquisitors rooted out all perceived heresy with torture, violence, and condemnation, seized or destroyed perceived false idols and forbidden texts. You can find the images of these false idols in these sleeping canvases, a place where such images are collected and hidden away. The sheer number of canvases here is evident 
evidence of the vast panoply of gods who were once worshipped in Sestodia. But today, only one remains. Only one of these idols spoke itself into existence on the other side of the dream, or was spoken into existence by the fervor of its followers' prayers. Today, only worship of the High Wills is permitted, and all else declared heresy. The bishops attempted to probe the mysteries of the High Wills. This new god birthed from nothing with mysterious motivations. The bishops crossed into dreams, delved into forbidden knowledge, but never came any closer to the truth, never truly understood the terrible god they served. Besides the religious transformation, I think this was a relatively quiet period for the kingdom. The miracle manifested itself here and there, in often grotesque ways, but nothing as horrific or as destructive as what we see in the present. There was no affliction yet, society still functioned. Ordinary people were still free to live ordinary lives, so long as they didn't fall under either the suspicious eyes of the Inquisitors or the grievous gaze of the miracle. All of that changed with the ascendancy of His Holiness Escribar. For Escribar, all of this wasn't enough. For him, the miracle hadn't made itself known loudly enough or often enough. He wanted something bigger. If it really existed, he wanted to feel its power. He declared that the miracle had turned its back on Sestodia, had abandoned its worshippers. And so he turned his thrones back to the people of Sestodia, a symbolic act. Even an act of defiance in the face of the High Will's perceived apathy. But he was wrong. The High Will's had not abandoned Sestodia and they were not apathetic. They heard Escribar's complaints, saw his petulant act of turning his throne, and they were not amused. The High Wills are a god who listens. If you ask it to punish you, it will punish you. If you ask it to burn you, it will burn you. And if you ask it to prove itself, to show its power, it'll do that too. The High Wills demonstrated their power in a devastating, spectacular, and horrific act now known as the Burnt Tree. This would transform Sestodia from a basically ordinary world of ordinary people into a freakish nightmare world of monsters and abominations. For all practical purposes, this would be the end of Sestodia. First, the High Wills twisted and lengthened and petrified Escribar's body, turned him into a tree just as they had done in the first miracle. But this time, they turned him into a giant tree, taller than the tallest cathedral spire. He towered over all of the kingdom. And to really prove their point, the High Wills burned Escribar's new massive arboreal form. They burned him for 90 days and he suffered for all of those 90 days. Three months of torture and pain. From the burning tree, a mountain of ash fell which consumed the Grand Cathedral. Everyone in the cathedral complex was buried. People attempted to ascend the mountain of ash, to sit upon Escribar's turned throne, believing that thus they could seize power, become the new High Holy. But each of these greedy souls sunk into the ash and were lost. Storms blew this terrible ash across the land, buried the surrounding cathedrals and the people hiding and cowering within. A pall was cast over the entire kingdom. From beneath the ash could be heard terrible, agonized screams of pain, as if the people trapped within were being tortured and broken. All of this punishment for Escribar's petulant folly. Finally, the people who had been buried beneath the ash re-emerged. In the miracle's ash, they had been transformed into hideous, freakish, and terrible new forms. Thousands of monsters leapt out screaming and snarling and howling. They spit fire, vomited poison. They bit and stabbed and lunged and killed. Their hearts were consumed by rage and sin. They spread across all of Sestodia, and with them, they spread the miracle's grievous touch, its death and corruption. The miracle began to manifest more often and in more terrible ways. Affliction and disaster ravaged the populace. Monsters hunted in the streets. Wounds would not heal. Tens of thousands died. Society collapsed. Eventually, the only town left was Albero, and even it was a quiet and charnel place. This is the Sestodia we explore in the game, a place which was destroyed by the High Will's demonstration of their power. Gruesome proof that this god had not abandoned the people whose psyche had birthed it. Next, let's examine the miracle as it is depicted in the game. The miracle has no voice. It will never tell the player what it wants or how it feels. It has no physical form. 
you will never see it, but it is not mindless. It has an intelligence, a will. It listens and it watches, it answers prayers. Sometimes it even punishes wrongdoing. Even rarer, it blesses the downtrodden and the beaten. Or in the very least, the high wills who direct the miracle's power do all of those things. Since it doesn't have a voice, we have to try to understand the miracle through its actions, through the grotesque manifestations of its power. Every single monster you encounter in this game is a creation of the miracle. All of those are people who used to just be ordinary people, who have since been transformed, their minds as twisted as their bodies. Except the miracle is not exclusive evil. It doesn't only cause pain and suffering. Sometimes it blesses its worshippers too. Sometimes it is merciful, even benevolent. One example is the player character. The penitent one should not be able to survive this journey. He should be killed, but every time the penitent one dies, the miracle heals his wounds and restores his life force, gives him another chance. The bile flasks the penitent one uses to heal his injuries after battle are another example. This miraculous blood flows unending from the wounds of the body of a faithful man who was well loved in the town of Albero. In death, his faith had transformed his blood into a healing liquid for the benefit of all. Another example are the Kissers of Wounds. These are healers who, as their names imply, kiss the wounds of the afflicted, and these kisses have been blessed with some small power by the miracle. Sometimes their kisses actually heal those wounds. In this way, the miracle offers some respite to those its painful form has touched. The boss Kirse is another interesting example. Kirse had been wrongly accused of heresy, condemned to death by burning. The miracle saw this and disapproved. After death, Kirse rose from the flames, reborn. But this wasn't quite the blessing it seemed at first, because he didn't stop burning. He never stopped burning. The miracle allowed this innocent man to survive his execution, but did not spare him the pain of it. Instead, the pain would last forever, for so much longer than if he had just died. Another boss, Our Lady of the Charred Visage, is another grotesque example of the miracle's mixed blessings. This disgusting boss was once a beautiful girl named Aurea, so beautiful that sculptors and artists artists used her face as a model in their creations. It was her face you would see on religious icons and statues, representations of the divine. Her features became so ubiquitous in Sistodia's religious imagery that people began to actually worship her beauty instead of the gods the imagery was meant to represent. But Aurea was not vain. She was a devoted and faithful worshiper. To prevent the people from worshiping her beauty, from becoming a false idol, she destroyed her beauty. She poured burning oil over her face, ruined her graceful features in a torturous act of devotion. But her face didn't stop burning. Just like Kirsei's body, her face never stopped burning, and she never stopped experiencing the pain. The miracle had seen her act of devotion, but was this a curse or a blessing, a reward or a punishment or simply more proof of the High Will's terrible power. In these two examples, you can see the dual nature of the miracle. It saves an innocent man from a wrongful death, but then condemns him to a fate even worse than death. It rewards a pious girl for her devotion, but that reward is an eternity of pain, perhaps a worse reward than any punishment. In this way, the miracle is contradictory and confusing. At least it seems contradictory and confusing if you assume it actually cares about rewarding or punishing its followers. But what if the High Wills don't care about that at all? What if their true purpose is something else altogether? What if the suffering of their followers is irrelevant to them? What if they are a purely selfish god who cares only for inspiring fear and worship? But we'll discuss that possibility more later. The most horrific and most fascinating example of the miracle's dual nature, the way its power both blesses and curses those it touches, is found in the story of Socorro, the pious lady of perpetual agony. Socorro lived near the hill upon which heretics were published publicly tortured for their sins. She had a deeply compassionate heart, and she so much wanted to relieve the suffering of those poor tortured souls that she begged the miracle to punish her in their stead. 
Both fortunately and unfortunately for her, the miracle answered her prayer. The cuts and blows meant for the condemned appeared on her body instead, saving them from this pain, passing it on to Socorro instead. Even while enduring these intense wounds, she continued to pray for the accused heretics. Such was her compassion. The wounds kept appearing. Because the punishments in Sistodia never stopped, her punishments never stopped either. Her body was broken, deformed, drowned in the injuries and bruises and afflictions. But she did not die. Through all this horrific pain and torture, decades of it, perhaps even centuries, unceasing, the miracle kept her alive so that she could do as she had requested and bear the pain of others. This story is so fascinating to me, this dual nature of the miracle. The miracle gave her exactly what she asked for, but it has also twisted her request, turned it into this horrific, eternal torture. Instead of being rewarded for her seemingly boundless compassion, Socorro was essentially punished for it. Her punishment is so much worse and so much more grotesque and so much longer lasting than the condemned people she prayed for. The miracle is a horrific force, but in some ways it's not any more horrific than we are ourselves. It gives us what we ask for. If the prisoners had never been tortured or punished, Socorro wouldn't be either. Her wounds are exactly as terrible as the wounds the inquisitors inflicted on the condemned. This is key to understanding the miracle from a narrative sense. The miracle's punishments are more bizarre and stranger than those of man, but not any less grotesque, not any less deadly. The setting of Blasphemous is this terrible and grand representation of humankind's capacity for violence and torture. This is a setting based on our real world's history. Sure, it's exaggerated, but people really were tortured in hideous ways in medieval Spain and not just in medieval Spain. The Spanish Inquisition didn't invent torture or religious persecution. These sins have existed in all times and all places in human history. Sistodia, this land of fanaticism and pain, is an exaggerated but not untrue reflection of our own world. The miracle is a narrative vehicle, a writer's tool to make this work, to explain how any of this is possible. But let's get back to the story itself. In spite of all these horrors, in the original version of Blasphemous, the miracle had actually created an arduous and esoteric path by which the people of Sistodia could be relieved of their guilt, and thus relieved of the miracle's own seemingly endless punishments. The miracle raised a single warrior from the dead, a nameless, faceless, voiceless nobody, a member of a condemned holy brotherhood, which had been declared heretical by order of His Holiness Escribar and slaughtered. This warrior was no one of any significance, but the miracle sensed in him the potential to walk that arduous and esoteric path to its end. So your character, the penitent one, is raised from death and set on that path, gifted a sword with the power to collect and hold guilt. The penitent one must face a dozen different terrible trials, defeat hundreds of hideous monsters in battle, must gather all the monstrous guilt of Sistodia into his special sword, even slay his holiness Escribar, who had been transformed into the most horrific monster of all, the last son of the miracle, the champion of the miracle, a final test to prove the penitent one's worth and devotion. Afterwards, the penitent one ascends the mountain of ash, this fateful ash which was born of Escribar's petulant folly, which served as the hideous womb to a legion of monsters, the source of so much pain and death in Sistodia. At the summit, the penitent one sits upon Escribar's turned throne, that symbol of sin, and there the penitent one stabs the sword into his own gut, thereby taking all of Sistodia's guilt into his own body. Finally, the miracle transforms him into a tree, the third tree, this one a tree of redemption. In this way, only the penitent one would be punished for Sistodia's guilt, and the people of Sistodia could finally be free of the miracle's curse. In this original story, it seemed as if the miracle had punished all of Sistodia for Escribar's folly, but also determined that this punishment had gone on long enough. It wanted to provide the people with relief, but didn't want to just cease the punishment on its own. It seemed as if it wanted the people to prove that they deserved to be relieved of their suffering, and so it created that path to redemption and set the penitent one on that path. 
In a twisted and contradictory and strange way, the miracle saved the world from its own punishment. Except in the Wounds of Eventide DLC, it was revealed that all of this was a lie. The people will never be free of the miracle's hideous punishments, because the miracle is just a manifestation of the High Will's power, and all the High Will's care about is increasing their own power. Through an even more arduous and even more esoteric path, it is possible to cross over to the other side of the dream, to cross over into the path of ancient procession, another dimension where the High Wills exist in the flesh. Here the High Wills are collecting the adoration of the people of Sestodia, and literally weaving it into the threads of another dimension, weaving it into their own flesh, to create a grander world and grander bodies to inhabit that world, to make themselves and their environment more and more glorious. They do this in the exact same way they once used the people's prayers to weave themselves into existence. The High Wills are a purely selfish god. They never cared anything about the people of Sestodia except as a natural resource. They mined the psyche and psychosis of Sestodia, the way a coal company mines a particularly rich vein, deep beneath the earth. The manifestations of the miracle were never meant to bless or curse, never meant to punish in a way that was fair or which made sense to the punished. The true purpose of these manifestations was to inspire the people of Sestodia to worship, to fear, to dread, to prostrate themselves, to become ever more fervent and ever more fanatical so the High Wills could gather more and more adoration and weave that adoration into a more and more glorious and eternal form. Ironically, it was in these manifestations that the High Wills sowed the seeds of their own destruction. In the creation of Mea Culpa, the special sword wielded by the player character, they created a sword capable of destroying themselves. In raising the penitent one back to life, they raised a warrior strong enough to defeat them. In the creation of the path to redemption, they also created a path that led to revelation, to the truth and to their own deaths. The High Wills are incredibly powerful, but not all-knowing. They cannot predict the consequences of their own actions. In the end, wielding the miraculous sword they themselves had crafted, the Penitent One destroys the High Wills, and with their destruction, all of the manifestations of the miracle vanish. Magic and wonder disappear from the world, along with the monsters and grotesqueries. And this includes the Penitent One's life force. His rise from death was a manifestation of the miracle's power, and when the miracle ends, so does his life. The land of Sestodia once again becomes a world much like our own, an ordinary medieval setting where ordinary people can live ordinary lives. Except maybe not, because with the death of the High Wills, something new is born. Some new life form, curled up in a fetal position in a womb of clouds, descends upon the earth. I don't know what the heck this thing is because no one knows what the heck it is, because the sequel hasn't come out yet. Considering the timing of its appearance right after the death of the High Wills, it must have some connection to that death, but I can't even guess what that connection might be. In any case, I do know that the miracle and the High Wills which birthed it are some of the most fascinating and strangest antagonists I have ever encountered in a video game. Their power was this incredible and hideous representation of mankind's own capacity to sin. But in the end, they turned out to be pretty ordinary themselves. Like a lot of other villains and a lot of other games, the High Wills are simply selfish. They cared about one thing, and that one thing was themselves. As amazing and contradictory and bizarre as the manifestations of their power were, their motivations were quite simple. They just wanted more power. What's interesting to me is that if the High Wills had acted differently, if they had chosen to serve as a benevolent god, if they had blessed their worshippers without also horrific cursing them, if they had doled out their punishments in ways that were fair and reasonable, they still could have been adored and worshipped and the Penitent One never would have destroyed them. They could have lived forever as benevolent gods protecting the people of Sestodia, gathering adoration, free to weave their paradise for eternity. But Blasphemous isn't a story about the goodness in humanity. Blasphemous is a story about our capacity for sin, and so the High Wills, as a reflection of ourselves, could never be better than our worst selves. As dark reflections of humanity, the High Wills could never be anything other than selfish and self destructive.